So good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the third and final lecture in this year's consortium's lecture series on consumer-driven and DIY science, promise, and peril. So uh, I am your moderator. My name is John Bischoff. I am the director of our Institute for Engineering and Medicine here at the University of Minnesota. And I'm just going to say a few words about the lecture series uh, before I introduce our, our speakers this morning. Um, this series is presented by the University of Minnesota's Consortium on Law and Values in Health, Environment, and the Life Sciences. I'd like to thank the planning committee, which includes Susan Wolf, who chairs the consortium, Amy Kirscher, Director of Food Protection and Defense Institute, Michael Osterholm, Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, sometimes known as SIDRAP, Michael Sadowski, who's the director of the Biotechnology Institute, Michael Georgiev, director of the Center for Neurobehavioral Development. Uh, the consortium is a university-wide center that links 19 leading university centers and programs to address cutting-edge societal issues posed by biomedicine and the life sciences. So I want to thank the consortium staff also for managing the logistics, getting me here on time, for instance, uh, and giving me uh, the appropriate uh, cues to help with the uh, speakers this morning. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Lisa Ike Moto, Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis, and she will speak on biohacking and cyborg rights, coping with promise and peril. I'll introduce her formally in a moment, and she will speak for about 40 minutes. We'll then hear from uh, faculty uh, commentary from Professor Francis Shen, who is an associate professor of law and a McKnight Presidential Fellow here at the university. And I will also present uh, and, and introduce him briefly before his remarks, which will last for about seven to 10 minutes. Uh, at that time, we will then open it up for your questions and comments. We have two microphones near the stage. You probably see them. One's over here and then on the other side as well. And to ask a question, I'd like you to go to the mic and identify yourself before you ask your question so that we may know who you are and, and we can all get to know each other a little bit. Uh, as with most of these consortium lectures, the event is being videotaped and live uh, webcast, so we encourage those participating live or via webcast to be part of this discussion. You can use the consortium email, which is consortm at umn.edu to ask questions. The video will also be posted on the consortium website in about 10 days for free public access. At this time, if you could please silence your cell phones and other electronic devices, I would appreciate that. Also, if you need to exit the room during the event, please, if you would, use the doors at the back of the room rather than uh, here near the front, which may uh, dis disrupt the speaker. Uh, there will be an evaluation form following the event, um, which I would encourage you to please respond to. Um, the consortium pays careful attention to your feedback, and it helps put on you know, excellent events in the future. To receive continuing education, CLE or CME credits for this, you must also send an email to consortm at umn.edu when you join the webcast to document your participation. All participants requesting credits will be required to complete a participant credit tracker form. This form, along with the evaluation form, will be emailed after the event, and both forms must be completed in order to receive credits. For the in-person participants to receive continuing education credits, you will need to sign in at the registration table, which you've probably already seen on your way into this room. Other healthcare or veterinary professionals can submit a statement of participation to their appropriate accrediting organizations or state board for consideration of credit. Uh, there are some disclosures. The planning committee member, Michael Sadowski, has relevant disclosures. He's a consultant for CPAC. LLC, Terramax, LLC, grant research support from CPAC, LLC, honoraria from many universities, royalties from Finch Pharmaceuticals, and he's a board member of Terramax, LLC. A copy of this disclosure is available at the registration desk for anyone who wishes to review it. 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Lisa Ikemoto is a JD LLM and the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California, Davis, and teaches bioethics, health care law, public health law, reproductive rights, law and policy, and marital property. Her research areas include reproductive and genetic technology use, healthcare disparities in public health law. More specifically, she focuses on the ways that race and gender mediate access to and impacts of biomedical technology use and healthcare. More, uh, I'm sorry, her recent work addresses reproductive tourism, the ways in which human gamete use links the fertility and biotechnology industries and the privatizing effects of informed consent. Professor Ikemoto is a bioethics associate of the UC Davis Health System Bioethics Program and a faculty associate of the UC Davis Center for Science and Innovation Studies. Let us welcome our speaker. Thank you. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. I want to thank Susan Wolf and the committee for inviting me here. I'm very, very honored to be part of this speaker series, and I also look forward to engaging with Professor Francis Shen and John Bischoff in the conversation that follows, and with all of you. All right. So I'm going to start by just setting out some basic terminology. So biohackers, and that's what I'm talking about today, experiment with a do-it-yourself spirit in non-institutional settings, garages, bedroom labs, and community labs. So biohacking is often defined in opposition to professional science, which is conducted by academics or scientists in universities, biotechnology companies, or nonprofit um, institutions. So biohackers generally describe sort of or set up two categories of their activities. And the first one is DIY bio, which I've written about before. DIY biohackers set up labs in garages, bedrooms, even closets, and they use community lab spaces. As I just mentioned, they play with plasmids, yeast, um, and CRISPR, um, the, the um, ge genomic modification technology. And then the other category of activities is body hacking. Um, and body hackers or grinders, as they're often called, modify the human body itself. They implant magnets, RFID chips, or drugs that they made in DIY labs. So I'm going to provide a quick overview of DIY bio, the first category, and then I'll focus in on body hacking, which has so far received less regulatory and scholarly scrutiny than um, DIY bio. And then in the last part of my comments, I'll turn to what I call the cyborg questions. Okay. So starting with DIY bio, biohackers embrace, embrace open science, open source science. Um, sorry, let me back up my slide here. So starting with DIY bio, this is just a snapshot. So DIY biohackers buy used equipment and fabricate their own, or they work in community labs, which are already stocked. Um, they manipulate microorganisms. Some of the projects are for fun and learning, like this make it yourself or do it yourself beer project. Some aim to address serious health needs, like this insulin project. Some make art. Um, in their labs. In the first few years, the media focused on efforts to make things glow. Fish, plants, and here beer. Beer is a big subject of DIY bio. Um, the message was that this is all in fun. That was the media message for a while. DIY's own um, narrative situates itself separate and apart from big bio, so again, institutional science. Um, and for some, it's about challenging the exclusivity and authority of big bio. It's a populist movement. So here's a statement by um, a biopunker or DIY biohacker, um, Radio Free Mer uh, Meredith. And if you look her up, and she's written this fairly, it's, it's a very eloquent um, sort of manifesto, if you will. And this is a quote from it. So we, the biopunks, are dedicated to putting the tools of scientific investigation into the hands of anyone who wants them. So it's about democratizing um, biology or science. So in that sense, DIY bio also distinguishes itself from citizen science. Citizen scientists work with and assist professional researchers. So has anybody here ever participated in a local bird count? Um, they're fairly common. Yeah, that's citizen science. 
DIY Bio claims the goal of, that the goal of democratizing knowledge production and, um, and thus disrupting both the elitism and market power of Big Bio. So in that sense, it distinguishes itself from citizen science. Biohackers embrace open source science in contrast to the secrecy and patent exclusivity of much academic and commercial bio. You can find their methods, goals, and findings on websites and blogs without paywalls. So here's one example. And if you, uh, pr you probably can't read the small print, but it's the first page of a description of how to manipulate E. coli bacteria um, without sort of all the big fancy and expensive equipment that you would need. Um, in a standard lab. Um, a lot of the glow-in-the-dark um, descriptions or, or information that you can find on the web start with a trip to um, the market. You start by buying seafood because some of it contains the bioluminescent cells that you need to make things glow in the dark. Um, so there's a lot of information out there on the web and that's what they consider or how they, how, part of how they carry out the sort of open source science. Um, so DIY bio has attracted the attention of law enforcement and regulators. There's been concern both about unintentional biohazard and bioterrorism. And that's attracted, for example, FBI oversight and some intervention by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so in fact, the primary legal issues flagged thus far for DIY bio have been the risk of biohazard, violation of FDA rules, and to some extent concern about patent infringement, unintentional or intentional. So my thesis when I wrote about DIY bio before was I evaluated DIY bio's claim to be separate and independent of big bio and found that in fact DIY bio and big bio are fairly closely linked. So DIY biohackers hold their own conferences um, and this is a global phenomenon. So this one is advertised for um, a summit that took place or a conference that took place in Helsinki, Finland, for example. There are, as I said, community labs, including this one in Silicon Valley, so positioned sort of right in the heart of mainstream biotech. Um, some DIYers cast themselves sort of in Silicon Valley terms as disruptors, as innovation seekers, and entrepreneurs. Um, and many follow the now well-worn path established by Big Bio. They position themselves as startups and seek venture capital. And what's interesting is that other entities have jumped into the funding. So this particular community lab is actually funded by Carlsbad, California. It's a city down in the biotech corridor in Southern California near San Diego. Um, so it, it's not just sort of all do it yourself. They're now getting support from different sources, including cities, but certainly also including, um, for example, synth synthetic, bi synthetic biology interests and stakeholders. Um, other scholars have shown that most DIY bi biologists are in fact either have science degrees or are professional scientists. Um, only 8% of DIY biologists work exclusively in home labs. The rest are working in community labs or in labs like this one. Um, this is Josiah Zayner, a well-known poster nerd for DIY bio. Zayner graduated from the University of Chicago with a PhD in biophysics and biochemistry. He worked in a synthetic biology lab as a NASA fellow and as a biohacker, he started the Odin. It's a company which sells biological materials and hardware for DIY biology. So this is a screenshot of his website for the Odin. Um, and it shows that what he's making available for sale. You can purchase a frog genetic engineering kit, a genetic design starter kit for glowing jellyfish bacteria, a biohacking 101 class, and also shown on the screen to your right is a genetic engineering home lab kit, so you don't have to assemble it yourself. Um, in 2016, the FDA tried to stop Zayner from selling a DIY fluorescent mead kit. Mead, mead is a form of, of beer or ale. Um, on the grounds that the protein for fluorescence was a color additive. Um, DIY bio is actually very loosely organized and has a range of identities and narratives. Uh, beyond what I just described. And so sort of at the end of the article that I wrote before, I just sort of posed the hope that it's the very lack of organized direction um, that leaves open the possibility of open science, shared production of knowledge, um, and the idea that learning, um, you know, in a shared and open way um, sort of, um, it might provide a new pathway 
um, for science and, 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 and in fact really distinguish itself from big bio in a positive way. All right, and now I'm gonna focus in on body hacking. So body hacking, as I said, uses the human body as the site of experimentation and modification. There are sort of roughly two groups of body hackers. One group aims at health improvement by improving their diets, their sleep habits, posture, exercise regimes, and so on. Um, it's mostly, it's about self-care. The other directly actually modify the human body with hardware, software, or organic material. Um, these are the body hackers or grinders I'll discuss. They refer to the body itself as wetware um, and the implants and additives as hardware. So um, this is a biomagnet, so I'm just gonna sort of give you sort of a sampling of some of the activities. So this, um, the implantation of these biomagnets was one of the early and popular forms of body hacking. So grinders use rare earth magnets and they implant them in things like in part, body parts, typically the fingertip. Um, and the magnet apparently gives you a literal buzz when um, you are near a microwave oven, for example, or even a hard drive. You can pick up bottle caps and paper clips um, with your fingertip. It's not functionally life-changing, <laughs> but it's the first foray, or a first foray, into integrating body with technology. Some body hackers, and this has become um, very popular, um, they implant NFC or RFID chips in their body. So NFC stands for Near Field Communication, and NFC tech allows devices to share data with other NFC-equipped devices. So it's used in smartphones. So a lot of you with smartphones have NFC chips in your phones, and you can use, that's why you can use your phone to pay for things. Um, it's that chip in there. So with an NFC implant, you can touch a friend's smartphone to share contact data through the NFC implant. And I'm quoting from an, the I Am Robot website, um, a biohacker website. I Am Robot sells the implants, in fact. You could also unlock electronic door locks um, with your chip, um, encode it with information like your blood type, um, encode it with an image, of your favorite pet, um, or use it as your gym membership card. RFID tags are similar. Um, we're probably more familiar with those. Um, clothing, an expensive item in stores, <laughs> often has an RFID tag on it. My cat has one. Um, a lot of people biochip their, you know, chip their pets um, in case your pet wanders off. Um, so if you have an R R RFID chip embedded in you, um, you become a transmitter um, and thus trackable. So not too long ago, a company called Three Square Market offered their employees on a voluntary basis the opportunity to have chips implanted in them to open doors, buy snacks, log into computers at work, and use office equipment like copy machines. And in the online community, it created this huge uproar about, you know, this is Big Brother, um, the Big Brother employer stepping in. But at the same time, body hackers were paying to have the chips implanted, paying several hundred dollars, in fact, to have these chips implanted. Here's another image. So there's a biohack collective called Grindhouse Wear Wetware, and they designed implants that offer the glow-in-the-dark effect. So glowing things are big, generally speaking, in the biohacking world. Um, these are LED lights, but they're meant to mi mimic the phenomena of bioluminescence. So I'm gonna mention just sort of a short list of some of the legal issues that have come up. Um, a lot of this is in the way of self-experimentation. Um, so before Zaner and Ascendance, the FDA had not intervened in self-experimentation, and in fact, there's very little law that prohibits self-experimentation. Self-experimentation in biomedical science has a very long history, and we've heard some of the sort of heroes um, who've done that. Think of Jonas Salk, who administered the polio vaccine he developed to his spouse and to his children. Walter Reed is often held up as an example of heroic self-experimentation. And I, when I was doing research on this, um, I had heard the story that when he worked in Cuba, um, with his team to prove that mosquitoes were indeed the transmitters um, of yellow fever, um, that he and his team had self-experimented. They had deliberately exposed themselves to mosquitoes um, who, that were likely carrying yellow fever so that they could prove the transmission. Um, and yet it turned out, I found, that um, Reed actually left Cuba before the pact was made. So it was two other members of his um, team who had made the pact and carried it out. Two of them contracted yellow fever one actually died, and the other became chronically ill. A third member was excluded because he'd already had yellow fever. 
So Reed himself actually never self-experimented, at least not at this particular moment in Cuba. So as I said, there's little or no law that prohibits self-experimentation. Some research institutions require ethical review, IRB review, and approval for self-experimentation, but that's a matter of institutional policy, um, not law. Um, Self-experimentation is often lauded as heroic, so um, here's, oops, sorry. Here's Aaron Trawick. I'll go back to the other slide in a moment. Aaron Trawick was um, a well-known um, um, biohacker, and he started this company called Ascendance Biomedical. And um, they created or hacked an HIV um, um, vaccine a few months before this particular incident. One of his, his colleagues had um, self-injected the vaccine into his body at this particular moment in early 2018 at one of the conferences, body hacking com um, conferences called Body Hacks, um, um, Aaron Trawick injected a, what he thought might be an, uh, a herpes treatment, because he had herpes, um, into his body and live streamed the event um, at the time. So, and as he did so, he sort of positioned himself alongside Jonas Salk and Louis Pasteur. Um, and, at the, and, and simultaneously sort of described them as sort of early body hackers. Um, if you will. So uh, self-experimentation is also criticized as poor research um, methodology. You have an N of one um, if you're doing this, or as Walter Reed's team demonstrated, sometimes it's simply too dangerous. Um, I'm gonna go back since I skipped this slide. This is, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I keep pushing the buttons. This is a biohacker. Um, self-named Meow Ludo Disco Gamma Meow Meow, also known as Mr. Meow Meow to those of us who don't actually know him. Um, he lives in Australia. He took his Metro card and he took the chip from that and embedded it in his hand. And then to get on the train or the local transportation system, he held his hand up to the screener and he was arrested um, and charged with not, not with writing without a ticket. Um, and he, the charges we eventually dismissed, he had to pay for fees, the cost of a legal prosecution. But because the charges were dismissed, he declared himself sort of, he declared it a sort of a victory for cyborg rights, um, if you will. So another body hacker. All right. So again, there's been some pushback against sort of the mode of self-experimentation and body hacking, including by Josiah Zayner, which is ironic because Josiah Zayner himself had, had, had publicly injected himself with a CRISPR DNA that he hoped would make his muscles bigger. Um, and then a few months later, when he saw Aaron Trawick's um, live-streamed event, he said, this is crazy. Um, he reconsidered and he made a statement, including this sentence, we need to figure out better ways to do this because you can't just keep injecting yourself with shit. Um, so um, a month after the first ascendance um, self-injection and Zayner's own self-injection, the FDA stepped in, in a sense. So they, they issued a statement. This is one part of it. It says the FDA is aware that gene therapy products intended for self-administration and do-it-yourself kits to produce gene therapies for self-administration are being made available to the public. The sale of these products is against the law. FDA is concerned about the safety risks involved. So the FDA has apparently asserted jurisdiction over self-experimentation, or at least a small slice of it. So I mentioned before, well, I'm gonna stay back here for a minute, here we go. I mentioned before that body hacking as opposed to DIY bio has attracted so far, I think, um, less scholarly and regulatory um, attention. And I think in part it's because we think of body hackers as engaging largely in self-experimentation. And the response, you know, the, the response very often is not just that it's dangerous, but also that, well, you can take the risk if you want to do it. The only person you're going to harm is, is yourself. And there's a sort of big concern about paternalism, um, if you will. Um, but now we have the FDA ste um, stepping in. And I think probably right about now that there is sort of a growing trend of, of closer, to, of both scholarship and I think regulatory scrutiny 
of biohacking activities. And I'll just give you one example. Um, one is that um, the, there's a science publication called CRISPR Journal. CRISPR Journal just issued a call for submissions on a special issue on ethics um, of CRISPR use. CRISPR is genomic modification technology or tool, um, if you will, and it's been in the news a great deal lately, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but on the list of possible topics that were suggested for submissions um, was body hacking. Um, and so if it's making the journals like, the science journals like CRISPR, um, and apparently they're worried that people will use CRISPR um, and body hacking together and thereby evade the FDA. The other kinds of legal issues that have been raised um, have been privacy concerns, um, primarily as NFC chips, uh, chips and implants have become more widely used. Um, there's a company in Sweden called um, Disruption or Disruption. Um, they have um, just or re relatively recently created a, um, a biochip that is two kilobytes of memory, so that more than doubles the existing capacity um, of NFC chips. So before you could put maybe a small image, or as I said, or maybe your, your blood type, a small bit of personal information on it. But the two kilobyte capacity increases the amount of information. These are fairly scannable. You have to get fairly close to somebody to scan. Um, but if you do, you could surreptitiously, surreptitiously collect um, quite a bit of personal information for people. So the privacy concerns about have been raised. So disruptions chip apparently is designed to help prevent that or at least alert people to the possibility of scanning. It flashes red um, if somebody n near you has a scanner. Um, it doesn't stop the transmission, but at least alerts people to the possibility. Um, so that issue is now on the minds of not just the sort of legal commentators, but the companies as well that are marketing these activities. Um, probably the most obvious um, issue that body hacking raises is the legality of, of, of cutting someone open <laughs> and inserting something um, in their body. Um, this is so far most often done by non-medical professionals. Um, much of the body hacking is actually not self experimentation. So it's done by other body hackers or now by these sort of informal or, or, or professional companies. Um, so it's possible, right, um, even likely that inserting chips, tags, magnets, and other hardware violates the state scope of practice rules. Um, for example, so I looked into the law of California um, and the laws, there are laws very specific, for example, for ear piercing. So you don't have to be a medical professional. You do have to be certified to do ear piercing. Um, for tattooing is regulated pretty closely in California. And then it's been opened a little bit wider for body piercing. So ear piercing is gone for body piercing. And it appears to me that a lot of the body hackers are trying to design the work that they're doing and the practices that they're using to fit into the body piercing rules um, that exist in any one state. Um, on the other hand, there's a biohacker named Jeffrey Tibbetts, and he gave a presentation in July 2017. You can find it on YouTube. He's a nurse by day, so he is a medical professional, and he's a biohacker by avocation. And then part of the point of his presentation was to say that, you know, I do this, and many people do this very, very carefully in sterile, um, and in sterile settings, and he carefully described the correct procedures, medical procedures to do in order to make this um, um, not risk and not a risk to health. Um, so he has performed many implants of RFID tags and much larger devices, um, some of them scarily large. Um, and yet he said, as far as I can tell, everything I do is legal and falls under laws pertaining to body modification. I mean, I think it's legal. Of course, saying something's legal doesn't mean it's safe. All right, I'm gonna shift from the descriptive, the practical and the legal to what I call the cyborg questions. Um, so both DIY bio and body hacking are simultaneously counterculture, critical of institutional science or big bio, um, and the, at the same time entrepreneurial and um, they serve as potential incubi uh, incubators for big bio. But I think perhaps what they do best at this particular moment in time, and it's moving quickly, so this moment may pass, 
is that they make important normative questions, questions about values and ethics more obvious and more open to public engagement. So many of the things that body hackers and DIY bio biohackers are doing raise the same kinds of questions that Big Bio does. And I'll give you some examples in just a few minutes. Um, but it's hard in the realm of Big Bio to really sort of um, dig deep into some of those issues. And I think that one of the reasons is that Big Bio is often, I think necessarily because of the way that funding works for Big Bio, it's accompanied by a lot of hype and hope. And that has the effect of deflecting us, um, turning our attention away from some of these big normative and ethical and value questions. Body hacking and DIY bio at this moment isn't accompanied by hype and hope in that same way. It doesn't have the same kind of deflective tendencies. So, so my hope at this moment is that we can use body hacking and DIY bio to raise the kinds of questions that big bio is raising, and yet we'll be able to dig deeper into them because it's not accompanied um, by these other kinds of narratives, if you will. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking about transhumanism. So body hackers, and this is different from DIY bio, body hackers situate themselves within transhumanism for the most part. And there's no one version of transhumanism. It's an ideology. Generally, transhumanists advocate for the use of technologies to expand human capacity and performance without limits. Um, transhumanists embrace biotechnology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, cloning, robotics, and so on, any technology or intervention, to make themselves stronger, faster, smarter, immune to, immune to illness, and even immune to death. So it's inherently libertarian. Some transhumanists seek what they call the singularity. So for people who are, who are into um, 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 science fiction, that term might be familiar. So the singularity will occur, according to transhumanists, um, and in particular Ray Kurzweil and Steve Aoki, when technology merges with biology to create a new super race, and thus the evolution of humanity in the proper direction. So in the interim, um, um, biohackers have issued what they call cyborg rights, and there's no one list of cyborg rights, there are different lists. So this is one of them put out by the Cyborg Foundation, and it's one of the most well-known lists. So I think I skipped my first slide here. I'm not gonna read it word from word, but you can see a little bit of it. So the first principle, for example, is freedom from disassembly, freedom from disassembly which stands, st starts out sounding like the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. A person shall enjoy the sanctity of bodily integrity and be from, free from unnecessary search and seizure, um, which is the constitutional provision that protects us in part from police searches without warrants. Um, and then it goes on, uh, protects us, uh, keeps us free from unnecessary suspension or interruption of function, detachment, dismantling, or disassembly without due process. There's also freedom of morphology um, and equality for mutants, which you don't see in our Constitution. A legally recognized mutant shall enjoy all the rights, benefits, and responsibilities extended to natural persons. So. As of now, the notion of cyborg rights rests on a distinction between natural persons on the one hand, right, and cyborgs on the other. And then here's the last two principles, the right to bodily sovereignty and a right to organic naturalization. This one's interesting, I think. Um, I also teach property and I work in property theory. A person shall be free from exploitative or injurious third-party ownership of vital and supporting bodily systems. So if you have technology embedded in your body, and some of us actually already do, right, then there are patent rights to those things. Um, and this, in a sense, is a pushback saying that over time, though, that becomes yours. Um, and we have similar property doctrines um, that primarily apply to land, real estate, if you will, that are incorporated into this particular cyborg right, um, if you will. All right, so that raises the question, what is a cyborg? So in 1960, Manfred Kleins and Nathan Klein defined the term cyborg in a paper addressing the possibility of altering human bodily functions to meet the demands of space travel. They proposed cyborg as a term for a human who, quote, deliberately incorporates exogenous components extending the self-regulatory control function of the organism in order to adapt it to new environments. Um, so in other words, they were proposing for space travel, not that we have these very elaborate suits 
right, um, um, spacesuits, right, that provide us with oxygen, but that we actually modify the human body so that the human body has been sort of pre-adapted um, for space travel. Um, and they use the term cyborg to sort of capture what the goal of that was. Okay, moving forward in time, in 2014, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the majority opinion in Riley versus California, and at issue in that case was whether police could conduct a warrantless search of data on a cell phone they had seized during an arrest. Um, the Chief Justice stated, quote, modern cell phones are now such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy. So Chief Justice didn't mention cyborgs in that opinion, but I think that statement shows that the lines between technology and the human body and our day-to-day -day lives, right, and the way we function in those lives um, are becoming thinner. So um, I wanna sort of run through a few more examples of cyborgs. So these are bio, I'm gonna start with the biohackers. Um, this is um, an image from Cyborg Nest, which is a company, um, and it defines itself as a mindware company. Its homepage says, we exist to contribute to human evolution. By experiencing the hidden parts of nature through new senses, we will evolve towards a richer life experience. Um, so what's being pictured here is you can see that square on the chest there, on the man's nest, uh, chest. Um, that's a cyborg nest product called Norsense. It's a silicon and titanium device that helps the wearer sense the magnetic, the magnetic north. Um, it was designed to be worn externally so that licensed piercers could perform the procedure legally. And for some external, but for some, on the other hand, external devices do not a cyborg make. So it's interesting to see sort of at this time sort of what definition of cyborg is emerging. And for some, it matters whether or not the technology is internal to the body or external. And so pushback against this particular claim of cyborgness is that it's external and therefore it doesn't make you a cyborg. This is Neil Harbison. So he's one of the founders of Cyborg Nest and also of the Cyborg Foundation, um, which promulgated the, the cyborg rights I just, I just described. So Neil Harbison was born with a condition called, uh, I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, a chromatopsia. It's complete color blindness. So he sees in what we perceive as black and white. So he had an antenna implanted in his head that translates color to sound waves. So he hears sound, he hears color. Um, and it's not removable. So it's attached to his skull, in other words. And he convinced the UK government um, to let him keep the antenna on for purposes of his passport photo. So Harbison is now known in the body hack world as the first person to be recognized legally by a government as a cyborg. So part of what I'm moving into is this sort of question about sort of um, what categories and distinctions that we currently use to talk about humans and non-humans and permissible uses of technology on humans and impermissible uses of technology on humans that are now being pulled into question, or maybe have long been put into question, but maybe are sort of um, being pushed sort of higher into our consciousness by body hacker practices. So some of the distinctions, for example, are humans versus cyborgs. Therapy versus enhancement has been in discussion in the news, news a lot recently. Um, disability versus normal um, or able-bodied. Um, the natural body versus technology, um, somatic versus germline with respect to genetic technologies, for example. So now consider these three examples from um, the world of big bio. This is Claudia Mitchell, a former Marine. She's the first woman with a bionic arm. Um, I don't know how many people in this room are actually old enough to remember the Bionic Man, the television series way back from the 1970s. So that's the, that's, that's where I learned the term bionic, if you will. So she lost her, she lost the arm she was born with in an accident, and I think it was a vehicle accident. The prosthetic that she has now enables her to control the arm and fingers by thought. Um, there are small robots in the fingers of the arm that um, uh, can sense touch and transfer that sense to her brain um, through her muscles. So the questions that raises is, does the interactivity um, that she experiences make her arm human, um, or does it make her less so? 
As far as I know, Claudia Mitchell does not identify as a cyborg. I haven't seen read any interviews or profiles of her in which that term is used. Um, but I think based on those interviews, she identifies as a human with a high functioning prosthetic arm. But if Neil Harbison, right, who I just showed with the antenna is a cyborg, is she a cyborg as well? And what about people with computerized insulin chips, pacemakers, IUDs, or people like me who need a double shot latte to get up in the morning and go? All right. In 2016, stem cell biologist Hiro Nakauchi at Stanford University, reproductive biologist Pablo Ross at University of California, Davis, and several other scientists from around the United States and their team, they introduced human cells into pig embryos in the lab. In 2018, they did, they did the same with sheep embryos. And the embryos were destroyed after 28 days, but while they lived, they were chimeras. Two, two minutes, okay. So they were part pig or part sheep and part human. So only the green cells are, are human in origin. Um, and the question is, what would make those embryos human? Um, or are they human already? Is it the percentage of the green cells that matters? Is it the location and function of the cells that matters? So what I'm going to do with my last two minutes is um, I'm going to run through, I, I, my purpose has never been to answer any of the cyborg questions, right? But I've identified in looking at the sort of conversations that have taken place both in the, with respect to body hacking and also with respect to these kinds of questions that come up in, D, in, D, in big bio, just some cautions about how we might proceed in these, in these conversations. So the first caution quickly is this is a picture of, um, in late November 2018, a, sci a scientist from um, China announced that he had used CRISPR, the genomic modification technology, on two human embryos that they had been implanted in a woman and she had been given birth to twins who, if this worked, now have a heritable trait um, that they can pass on to their children. So this has created an uproar. Again, CRISPR has created an uproar. It did so first in 2016. And it puts onto the line the question about uh, the, line, the ethical line that's been drawn between um, using these kinds of change, uh, body changing and human changing technologies for therapeutic purposes, which is considered ethically permissible, or for enhancement purposes, which, con which is considered more questionable. And so as we proceed into that conversation, as I said, I just want to flag a couple of issues. One is that it turns out these lines are very, very mobile um, and um, changeable. So we draw these distinctions, these categories, and these, and these lines, and yet it turns out they're fairly manipulable. And I have a couple examples that maybe we can go into in discussion. The other kinds of things is that um, there is a question about equality, and it most often comes up in conversation about saying, well, not everybody's going to be able to afford these technologies. It's not accessible, and that's not fair. The other way it comes up is saying that, well, we like an equal playing field when you sort of give, for example, athletes, um, you know, um, uh, steroids, right? That means that gives them an unfair advantage. I think the problem is actually deeper. Um, it's not the technologies themselves, it's sort of how we think of the people who've been enhanced or how we think of the people, mm -hmm. how we define what it means to be better than someone else. Um, and I think when we have these conversations, we have to dig deeper into notions of fairness and equality than we already have. And then the very last point that I'll make is that it's about Frankenstein. So very often when these things happen, the people who want to proceed without sort of regulation or restriction on the use of these technologies say, this was an exception, right? They say, this was the mad scientist. So Dr. Hay in China is now being posed as Dr. Frankenstein. He was a mad scientist. He was the exception. We'll proceed cautiously and ethically. The other thing that I've noticed has happened in the past few years repeatedly, and certainly in this case, I'm going to skip that for now. Here we go is that it becomes geopolitical pretty quickly. So part of the conversation that's taken place recently is this is China. There's something wrong with science in China. So it becomes nationalized. Um, and this is probably the third example I've seen in the past five years um, of China or some other country who's in competition um, with the United States or the other Western countries being used. So that's my last caution. I'll, I'll stop right there and I look forward to our conversation.
So now it's my pleasure to introduce our faculty commentator. This will be uh, Professor Francis Shen, who has a JD and a PhD. He's an associate professor of law and the McKnight Pres Presidential Fellow at the University of Minnesota. Shen serves as executive director of education and outreach for the MacArthur Foundation Research Network and uh, on law and neuroscience. Uh, Professor Shen conducts empirical and interdisciplinary research at the intersection of law and the brain sciences. He has co-authored the first law course book on law and neuroscience, which is by Aspen. Uh, you can find it with Aspen Publishers, and has explored the implications of cognitive neuroscience for criminal law, tort, and legislation in the United States. Professor Shen. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks um, to the consortium, to Professor Wolf, all the consortium staff for making this happen, Professor Ikimoto for coming uh, this way, to, to Professor Bischoff for uh, making things run so smoothly. Uh, I'm just here really to be a bit of a provocateur to offer a few comments and thoughts. Um, one other piece by way of introduction is I teach a course on law and artificial intelligence, and you have hit on so many of the themes that we hit on. What does it mean to be human? Where is that line between man and machine? And I would just have you think for a moment, we won't raise hands, about whether you or someone you know has any of the following or has done any of the following. Pacemaker, which you mentioned, hip replacement, surgery where they kept a, an iron piece inside you, or this morning maybe someone put into their body little pills, or you did it last night, or you're even carrying them right now with the reminder to do it sometime today. Much of that is normal. So normal that when you go to the airport, you mentioned airport screening, you say, okay, anybody have a piece of metal with your body over in this line? And nobody goes like, there's the cyborgs, oh my God. No, you just like, okay, that's the metal line. It's normal, but is it natural? And does that matter? And these are the sorts of things that Professor Ikimoto's work has raised and, um, in really neat ways. So I'm just gonna try and do three things. A personal story, uh, which will be in part my answer to some of the questions you raised, like where do I stand on the sort of man-machine issue. Uh, a Venn diagram uh, to try and get at this sort of the, the do-it-yourself part and the cyborg part, and then just one question uh, at, at the end. So the personal story goes like this. Uh, as Professor Bischoff said, um, I run a lab. Our, our motto is every story is a brain story. The big challenge is that every story is a really poorly understood brain story. Um, and we do lots and lots of stuff. And by the way, if you're a student here at the U, we're, we're always hiring for new students. So you can come work with us. Um, and I also uh, direct a, a center uh, at MGH. We try and translate that into real world action and do a lot of stuff. And I'm not going to go into all we do. What I put this up here is that I'm always trying to find ways to improve the way that I do this stuff. And one of the ways that I tried last year was to use transcranial current pulse stimulation. Transcranial stimulation is kind of what it sounds like. You go through the cranium, you throw electricity into your brain, and you see if your brain can function ways that you would like it to function better. And in particular, I tend to work really late into the night, and so I had a videographer come over with me, and over at Mondale Hall, I'm often in there, I know the late night janitor, I'm like in there after midnight all the time, this was 2 a.m., I said, all right, this device called Think, it's uh, uh, Professor Jamie Tyler, Arizona State, claims, it's not FDA approved, it's just for enhancement, claims that it will give you an energy boost. And I'm not a caffeine person, so I thought, oh, maybe this will work. So here's a picture of me, about 2 a.m., Mondale Hall, connected to my iPhone, here's the feel, you can kind of see there's a little electrical patch sending energy into my body. The bottom line in the video is that it did absolutely nothing <laughs> other than give me like a little heat sensation. But I raised this because to me, this made a lot of sense to do. But I never once thought of myself as hacking my body. And I think that word is really interesting and the images that are associated are really interesting. Now I happen to be wearing a t-shirt because it was the summer, but otherwise I would have been wearing a suit. I wouldn't have had weird looking hair. I wouldn't have been very cool or very rad. There's a way in which so many of the images, what, what they are doing is the same thing I was doing, trying to manipulate the cells or some other part of my body in ways that for whatever I think my values are, you know, allow me to do the things that I want to do. And that's what they're trying to do too. But you know, what's in the word hacking? I think it's worth interesting. I think your work raises that and really interestingly raises the question of how much is this is about just the new technology to change the way that our bodies work versus making a stand and doing that in a certain way and publicizing it. Um, so that's where I stand. So I like that. 
Now here's the Venn diagram. Uh, Professor Ikimoto has raised in this paper and in this talk sort of a related set of questions. On one hand, the do-it-yourself, and on the other hand, the cyborg question, the, the cyborg question that you raised. And I was trying to think about it, so which to me, is, and of course, and then there's in the middle, right? So you can do all sorts of things to do it yourself. So here's an example, like just a do-it-yourself science kit that kids can get. And there are all sorts of cyborgs, what I would call cyborgs running around, though maybe you're right, they don't self-identify as those, so pacemakers. And these things are normal. And then some of the newer stuff um, in the world of brain, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, uh, do it yourself, is becoming a thing. You take uh, a wet sponge, you take a battery, you hook them together, and again, you send electricity through your brain. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, the ability to have deep brain stimulation. It's been well over a decade, groups like Medtronic, and we are some of the experts in the world here at University of Minnesota for uh, patients with Parkinson's, uh, treatment-resistant depression, and so forth. Now, to me, I think, and in reading the paper, that the do-it-yourself stuff is, is interesting, but isn't really, to me, the big story of the future. And the reason for me it's not is that there are just really some hard limits to what you can do by yourself. Science today is increasingly social and collaborative. It's why on these science papers, you know, the number of author names that goes on and on and on. It's just so difficult to do things by yourself, and do-it-yourself hers no matter how, you know, they can, they can do great things, but they'll never do anything big like this. You know, just the monster stuff. The major, major breakthroughs, to me, are going to come not from the do-it-yourself side, uh, but on the other. And so for me, I, I want to focus a little bit on this cyborg set of, of questions. I think that's where the answer, or where, where, you know, the real questions are. And I think you're right that the questions you raised at the end of your talk um, are really, really challenging. Um, it's unclear, one, what the trajectory is of the science uh, as uh, humans meet machine. It's unclear what language we should use. And by we, there's both sort of the what should we use in society, but then what language should the law use? Um, and uh, it's interesting that on the Cyborg Bill of Rights, you know, um, there is a distinction, as you raised, between sort of the natural person and the mutant. But man, it's really hard to know, let's say with cochlear implants, we get into disability law. So, and there's a big, there's a big debate within um, these communities about the extent to which something is a disability that is something to be addressed or cured, or something is just a difference to be embraced and valued. And how do we know the difference? Now, again, there's a societal aspect of that. How do we judge someone? How do we engage with them? There's the legal question as well. And there's the money question attached with the legal question, do you get disability benefits? All right? So you might on one hand want to say, this is not a disability, this is just a difference, embrace it, while at the same time saying, I ought to be getting some disability payments and some additional services, right? How do we balance, how do we ba balance those? I think the question that you raised about enhancement is also a really, really important one. Um, you know, and I'll go back to the, the thing that I was doing there. Should that be encouraged? And if so or if not, how would we distinguish other forms of enhancement? So in my lab, I encourage all my students to get good sleep at night, to eat the right way, to exercise, because those things have been shown to improve brain function in a way that self-servingly is good for me. I think it's also good for them. Should I, so if I'm that doing that, what about other forms of enhancement, right? Uh, enhancement like the ones that I just showed you. Should I be encouraging them to that? And then I want to get to just you know, raise this question. I think your paper really gets at, and your visual images are really there. Does it matter if things go under the skin? Right. There is some, and your question about the phone and your great quote from just, Justice Roberts is right. So many of you right now, and mine's over there, so I'm like a little far away from it, but it's most of us, most of the time, have this technology now right here. And it's, I mean, just look around, it's always right here. Is that really different from a legal perspective, from kind of an ethical perspective, than having it under, or some component of it, under the skin? And if so, why? And if not, why not? My prediction that um, our colleague, uh, we were just talking about Hank Greeley, has this great notion about, it's great to make predictions, and in particular, make them for well after your, your lifespan, so that you can never be, you never know if you're wrong. Um, but my prediction, and I've told my kids this, they're five and seven, is that implantables will become the norm. Uh, in a variety of ways, because I think the big hesitation is actually the fear of, oh my gosh, a surgery. But no one other than a few of us still have a fear really of the shot, right? It's, you just look the other way and it's done quickly. 
And to the extent that these sorts of surgeries and procedures can be done super quickly, while you're just watching a five minute show, you turn around, you don't feel it, I, it's my, my hunch, my prediction is that we're gonna have more and more of us with these implants, which goes right back to your question, that how do we handle this um, collectively? And on those, those answers, those, those I don't know. So let me get, I think I have just a couple more minutes here to um, then dwell on this big question, or maybe it's 60 seconds. So here it is, and this one I don't have a great answer to, though um, I do have an in inclination. Does embracing, right now we embrace. You actually, you don't usually hold, you're embracing your phone. In fact, and I, I think that word actually, we usually use that word to describe two lovers embracing. But think about the last time you were in your house, where's my phone, where's my phone, where's my phone, right? And then you got it, you're like, okay, okay, right, I've got it, right? You're embracing it. Does embracing technology, or indeed as Professor Ikimoto challenges us to think about embedding it, make us more or less human? Does it make us more or less human? Uh, I'm not gonna try and answer that question, but I hope that we will think about it. And the last thing I say is that, um, you know, uh, in this quote from Bill Gates, I, I love it in so many contexts, he says about technological change in general, we often overestimate how much change will happen in two years and often underestimate how much change will happen in 10. And I think Professor Ikimoto is really onto something here. And I think the biohackers, to me, one of the great things that they do is kind of show us where the future, future is gonna be. Not in two years. We're not all gonna have implants in two years. But give us a decade. Give Professor Bischoff's Institute on Engineering and Medicine another two decades or three decades, right? Yeah, we're gonna see, I think, some really big, big changes. So thanks so much and look forward to the discussion. series presentation we had a couple of years ago uh, about fecal transplants. This university is a big pioneer in this area. And one of our speakers talked about a situation, a real situation, where a physician declined to perform a fecal transplant on uh, a child. And so the child's mother instead I think, uh, as I recall, guided by YouTube videos, which are out there, <laughs> performed it herself. Wow. So it was a DIY intervention performed on her child. Um, there are other examples out there, parents who are really uh, desperate sometimes to figure out how to help a child that may have a, an undiagnosed, rare uh, condition. Uh, that physicians can't pin down and figure out how to treat, where the, the parent themselves may engage with the literature and try and figure out things to try with their child. <laughs> so it seems to me in some ways the easier case that more readily escapes legal control is when people are doing it to themselves, yeah. but what about when people are doing it to their kids? So, please. Oh, good. I get the first hand. <laughs> she starts out with a really hard question. It is a really hard question. I mean, I think on the first hand, as you point out, there's a distinction in the way that we think about it. I think a longstanding distinction between sort of doing to you something that only affects yourself, primarily affects yourself, and then on the other hand, doing something to others. And most of the body hacking I, examples I've seen, um, it's body hackers implanting something in somebody else's body. And so it's not self-experimentation in the sense. It's not self-implanted. That seems to be le um, less common. So this takes it another step further down the road. It's to somebody who we don't regard as capable of giving consent. So somebody is making the decision on their behalf. And it's a child, right, who we see as vulnerable um, in addition to that. So that's sort of this, this, the way I think that lawyers would start to sort of sort this out um, at the outset. And then I think as bioethicists, then we think of, well, you know, where are the analogies for this? You know, we hack our children all the time, right? We do what we try to think. So when my son was young, he's now 16, it was those stupid videotapes, um, the Beethoven, Mozart videotapes. We all thought we were making our children smarter by having them watch videotapes with classical music playing um, on them, right? And we were hacking their brains. And then it turned out, of course, it did nothing. Um, except it kept them entertained long enough so we could take showers. 
Um, so, you know, you, it's not, the question is sort of where does this fit on that spectrum? And the sort of classic way of dealing with this is to weigh the risks and, and benefits. And the example that you give, that seems risky compared to playing a videotape <laughs> for your kid while you take a shower, right? It's, it's a physical intervention. There are a lot of unknowns um, still, even though fecal trans transplants have become somewhat standard, there's still a lot of unknowns about that. It's still in research. Uh, and so that's more problematic. And then the transhumanist question or the cyborg question, so I'm not going to answer your question. Um, <laughs> the cyborg question is, and because I've looked into human microbiome research, is that it goes back to some of what we, what we talked about, is that we're used to thinking the human as, as um, defined by the human body. And we define, and the medical model of the human <coughs> body is to look inward. Right? So when we think about health, we address what's going on um, within the body. And that's what biohackers are doing, is they're turning technology within the body, as if it's the body that needs to be fixed, as opposed to our environment, our society, um, you know, in contrast to that. So the microbiome research is interesting, because I think what it's shown is that several pounds of what we think of as our body is actually microbes. Um, and for so long, we treated microbes as if they're the enemy, right? And again, it turns out they're our friends, right? We have symbiotic relationships with many microbes, and we couldn't live without them, right? And that's what the fecal transplant research does. So would that make your child a cyborg, right? You've introduced foreign fecal microbiota <laughs> um, into your child's body, and so it's not theirs, and it didn't come from you. Um, at least not your own body, your own microbiome, and have you, have you now also made your child um, a cyborg? So it doesn't answer your question, but I think so, it sets out sort of the analytic structure that I described sort of sets out some of the lines that we are currently using. And maybe what the question introduces is the idea that we, maybe the question is not, does something make us more human or less human, right? Um, but, um, What's our understanding of what it means to be human that we're moving into? Yeah, I, would, I think it's a great answer. So I, and I think the cost-benefit model um, would, was, was one of the, the lenses that the law would apply. Another one that the law would apply through a criminal law um, perspective is at what point does omission or commission by parents vis-a-vis -vis something of their child um, constitute abuse or some other sufficiently bad thing that the parents will suffer? And the classic example that we teach in criminal law is um, what if because of religious beliefs the parents refuse to take a child to the hospital? They don't believe in modern medicine. If they had taken the child to the hospital, it was an easy pneumonia, would have been um, cured. Are they guilty of some sort of homicide? Or do we respect their uh, parental prerogative to raise their child as they want? And I think these questions are like commission questions. Are there certain things you could do to your child that would be problematic? Um, but if, if the world develops in the way that I think it will, um, I think there will be a pressure point, and we see this with immunizations right now. The next phase is, and we're having that question as a society, how, to what extent do we allow parents to make a choice about their kids' immunization? Uh, and I think we'll ask the same question about other sorts of medical treatments, both above and below the skin. So I was gonna maybe change the direction just a little bit. I reached out to uh, David Largispado, who runs our Genome Engineering Center here on campus and, and told him about your lecture and uh, he was quite interested when un unable to attend. But uh, he had a few thoughts and so I'm gonna share at least one of those with you. Um, one is that this um, kind of is in the area of ge genetic modified organisms, right? And so he was sort of posing this question, you know, to what extent um, is this like GMO, and, and to what extent are we sort of overreacting because GMO is everywhere? And, and uh, uh, a lot of people who think of organic foods, right, many of those organic uh, foods are actually GMO in the sense that they've been irradiated, and yet we accept them, and, and they are part of our lives. We don't even think about it anymore. So is that blending now with what you're talking about in terms of DIY bio? Um, yes, um, and I'm going to, 
so this may not sound responsive, but in my mind it is. So hopefully I can make <laughs> <Okay>. that clear. <laughs> sure. So one of the ways that these conversations take place is that we automatically, like, as I just did in response to Susan Wool's question, is we start thinking of analogies. And the other thing we think of is, is we do what, what Francis did so well, was to show that, well, you know, these things, all, all these questions and these technology uses, right, really exist on a very sort of finely tuned spectrum, right? Um, so they're, the distinctions between, the lines that we're drawing are really not big, thick lines, um, if you will. So when you think about GMO foods, right, and even if you talk about the fact that we haven't directly sort of modified the genes in these foods themselves, they've been bred over decades, if not centuries, mm -hmm. right, to the point that they're genetically modified by humans in that sense, right? And so how is it different to have GMO sapiens? So one of my colleagues, Paul Knopfler, actually wrote a book about called GMO Sapiens, so that's why I'm using that. It's a great book. Um, and so, you know, haven't we been living with the idea of being genetically modified for such a long time? Right. Yeah, and so you could look at it. That I think the idea of the spectrum is useful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you, we shouldn't draw lines right. within that spectrum. Yes, um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But well, I, I, I would agree, and I, and I do think that um, there's a certain aspect of which some of the visual versions of what you showed really, um, uh, really affect the social response and therefore, yeah. therefore the law. Um, you know, and, and with the genetic, genetically modified, you know, focus, people focus on things like putting chemicals in it. No one cares about crop rotation. You know, crop rotation is amazingly powerful and it's about unnatural as it gets. Like the natural world didn't suddenly rotate crops, and yet, um, but there's just some, like there's some, some intuitiveness. So I, I do think there's a bit of overreaction, um, but that it's explainable overreaction, and that over time, if certain of these procedures become safe and effective, that you'll see less of that, that pushback. But I would agree that we still have to do some line drawing. Sure. I think we have a question. Oh, sorry. So I'm Perry Hackett. I'm in. I'm also a co-founder of the Center for Genome Engineering, and I've established three biotech companies that are involved with, um, I guess, DNA hacking. My first paper on that actually came out 53 years ago, so <laughs> I've been at it for a lifetime. Thanks for coming. I was kind of surprised that in vitro fertilization wasn't brought up. When it comes to biohacking, we're at the 40th anniversary of that. That caught the world by surprise. It certainly was more of a surprise and more horrendous when it came out than what uh, He Zhang Kui did in, in China, despite all the noise that my colleagues make about that. Um, and then here at the University of Minnesota, of course, we're, we're known for a very long time for pioneering all of the bone marrow transplants and making human chimeras. I'm involved with CAR T cell therapy, which soon will be off the shelf, which will be about the same thing. What strikes me, though, from the point of view of setting up little companies is we're not big bio, <laughs> which can only compete with governmental regulations. Uh, we're little bio, and we're really trapped because government regulations proceed at a glacial speed, yeah. and genetic science is exponentially growing all the time. And so for this forum, my big curiosity is, how do you resolve the problems of repression of glacially advancing law with exponentially exploding science? That's great. Okay, that's a great question. It's huge. Um, and actually, you're probably going to be better at answering this. It's a, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the huge question right now, partly because the model of science changed in the 1980s so that so much of the innovation is taking place, as you said, in, the, in the, what you call the small bio world. Um, um, and or regulation moves very slowly, I think in part because of the lobbying power of science. Um, there's huge resistance to any kind of innovation in law um, because the concern is that if we have innovation, it's going to be more restrictive. Um, but on the other hand, leaving things the way they are is just as restrictive in many sense. So it might be that we just need to think about how we govern technology in a way that's different than how the United States currently does it. 
So I think there's some models in Europe where they think in terms of governance as opposed to regulation. Um, that might be sort of how we start to think of things. But we're so tied to the market model right now that it's hard, I think, to think of alternatives. Um, well, and then just well for, for instance, it's why Monsanto was uh, acquired by Bayer. And a lot of it had to do with just finding an even bigger entity yeah. that could counterbalance the repression of the uh, various governmental organizations that were demanding ever-increasing amounts of, well, really nonsense. <laughs> well, to what extent is this also an opportunity, though? If you look at DIY bio, right? I mean, we academics and people who start companies, we try to hold things, right? But the DIY bio, the whole thing that I can get out of this after you know looking at it for a week, Perry, <laughs> is that they want to set it loose. They want to release it. They want to let the science, you know, the democratization of science and, and letting everybody around the world pick up these uh, tools. So in, is, that's actually what David was saying, too, is that maybe this is an opportunity for people to, you know, to learn. Maybe it's an opportunity to, uh, you know, inspire people to get into this field and, and, and revolutionize it. Yeah, I, I just look at DIY, DIY bio as what little entrepreneurs try and do in order to get their stuff out for themselves. Oh, yeah, that's, how, that, that's their model. Yeah. You are their model. Yeah. And I also wanted to thank you for mentioning in vitro fertilization, because I first got, I work largely on um, assisted reproductive technology issues. And so I first looked into this sort of as a way of reframing the issues in assisted reproductive technologies. Well, you could have a conversation with Dr. Wolf about yeah. the issues of PGD and not just looking for disease variants that are passed on, but also other variants as occurred with the Molly Nash right. situation. Great. Did Thanks. you want to? I don't know if uh, just two quick another. things. One, I'll say that um, uh, on the IVF and uh, assisted reproductive technology, which I know is also your expert area, it really raises this question that I was flagging before between what are those genetic uh, differences that we think we should embrace, and which ones should we, if we could, eliminate from the germline? And this is an active debate in several European countries around Down syndrome. Uh, and um, some are being very effective in, take, in, in um, having a world in which there are no uh, humans with Down syndrome. And for some, that is the, a, a modern miracle and something to be strived for. And others, it is a sign of the human apocalypse. And those sorts of divisions are not likely to be solved by science. Those are social and political and religious divisions. And I think it goes to the regulatory side, especially in stem cell research. And I work with uh, Walt Lowe on human animal chimera work, and which, as you know, is there's a moratorium on some of this work from the, the chimera work. Um, and I think those sorts of moratoriums and those concerns arise out of the social, political, religious concerns, and that affects the regulation as well. And so there's a, a bigger strategy that almost has to happen it, it, to kind of move things forward, a very challenging one. Great. We have another question. Hi. My name's Joe. I'm a PhD student in John's lab, bio mass transfer. And I have a little more somber. I have a slightly more somber question. So science seems like, in today's climate, it's like a race to be first, the first one to discover so you can publish. But to what extent should we rethink the practice of publishing scientific findings if they open the opportunity for, like, dangerous technologies to be made, like CRISPR could potentially have really good effects in curing diseases, but it could also be used to weaponize viruses, or like to what extent do we have to regulate that, or to what extent should the public be open to, um, should what extent this information, should that be made public? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's a counterpoint to the, sure. the claim of open science or the potential benefits of open science. I mean, the question really came up with the dual use um, um, paper. Um, and so, you know, we faced it at least in that one instance. Um, and that is the concern of, you know, I had the slide about sort of the FDA statement. They've been actually attending um, the DIY bio conferences um, in, a, in a fairly public way, making themselves sort of friends. Um, with the biohackers at those conferences. In part, what they're doing is soft regulation, right? So instead of sort of prosecuting anybody actively, right, they make the presence known, right, and say, we're watching you. Um, but it's because they're concerned about, you know, 
the fact that, yeah, CRISPR is usable. Um, a biology major could use it to modify something. It doesn't necessarily mean they successfully engineer something, you know, pathbreaking, but they could make something dangerous accidentally or intentionally. Um, so I don't think shutting down publishing is necessarily the answer. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm sort of a strong believer in the sense that it's not necessarily the technology that's the problem. Um, it's the it's the way we think of it socially and ethically. Um, so it's the context into which it falls, into which we use it. So we need to hack our society, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but like, at least with CRISPR, it's very complicated. You, there could, you could perceivably, it could get really easy in the future where all it would take is just one person to print out a DNA sequence that's already on the internet for like Spanish flu. Or Ebola and merge them, and now how do you how do you stop people from doing it? Well, Especially uh, when everybody's doing it at home now, like it's probably. So would you like risk, to yeah. take another a gander at that, or I? You have something to say? Yeah. Well, I was yeah. just going to say. I mean, we brought this up in lab meeting the other day, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so we, you're ready for the we question. Were, yes. We were we were thinking about this, so. Um, but what we started talking about uh, is that you know there's lots of technologies that are like that, right? Yeah. You can find many examples, and what ends up happening is you end up regulating. And I mean, you can look at like who can who, who's able to make a nuclear weapon today, right? I mean, it's it's there are similarities there, and I don't know whether you know I don't know Professor Shen or Professor Egimoto if you want to comment on on that, right? Because CRISPR is is one technology. There are many, and. Um, I think you kind of already touched on that, I think, in your answer. Yeah, I just think in, in the word regulation is how we've handled other things. Maybe the analogy to think about is 3D printing devices. So um, there are now a variety of federal and state and local agencies that, that collaborate to prevent certain types of stuff going on the internet. Hey, use your 3D printer to do X, Y, and Z. Um, we want 3D printers, and they're in most schools now. You know, they're, they're showing up to so many places. but you're right that their uses could be very problematic. So I think the typical legal response would be, in a word, regulation, um, which, so you can anticipate, is, is choppy and not always uh, efficient, but it's kind of the best, best choice we have. Thanks. Thanks. Another question? Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm a neuroscience GCD undergrad. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you see us eventually having to consider excluding individuals with certain levels of augmentation from participating in like sporting events or other competitions under the basis of performance enhancing? And then on the DIY side of it, um, because there are CRISPR applications that accomplish transcriptional activation or repression without any actual genome alteration, how do we navigate like enforcing or restricting or regulating these kinds of applications for those purposes? Yeah, so I mean we're already restricting in the sports arena. There's a lot of testing in the Olympics, for example, um, um, or in, in other professional sports. I mean, we've had scandal on, after scandal of using different kinds of substances or other performance enhancers. So that's an existing issue. Um, and um, so I, I guess it continues. I mean, the, but the question then becomes, the set going to your second point, is that um, it's going to be about detection. So maybe the answer is not that we prohibit, um, but, and I'm not a sports person, so <laughs> I probably can't answer that aspect of it, but your question goes to the, the, the sort of larger point that I tried to make before, not larger, but, but slightly related point that I made before about how we um, often think of enhancement as something that gives somebody an unfair advantage, um, and when we think of that, we're thinking about that in terms of competition, whether it's athletic competition or not. Um, and that's interesting because not all societies are so inherently comp competitive, right? That that's the first thing you think of when you think of enhancement, is how is this going to help somebody beat me, right? Um, so to, that, it goes back to my point in a sense about sort of what are the underlying sort of assumptions about what the purpose of enhancement or therapy or changing somebody is. So that doesn't address the sports thing because sports is obviously inherently competitive and I don't think, I think if you changed, took out the competition from sports, it wouldn't be sports. <laughs> or at least that's my understanding of it. Um, 
the detection issue is different. I just, you know, I, we need scientists for that. So I don't know if you have different thoughts about that. Well, there's another question, so maybe I'll just call Thank you. Them. Thanks. You uh, made a very interesting uh, brief uh, statement of contrasting the European way of oversight, which I think you characterized as governance, in contrast to the U.S. mechanism for oversight, which you characterized as regulation, which I think we all appreciate. What, uh, would you explain that further? What are we, what are we doing or missing or? Can I ask the, you to identify advantage? yourself uh, as well, just so we can hear uh, who Say you are? What? Can, may you please identify yourself? Oh, I'm Mark Scavioni. Great, thanks. Not connected with the university or any medical or whatever. Uh, Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. Would you uh, contrast those and what are the advantages, for example? Or yeah, what so. What are we missing, for example? Well, for example, in the United States, and maybe there's not a fine distinction between sort of a regulatory approach such as we have in the United States and what I mean by governance. Um, I think what I really meant was in the United States, um, the way we regulate. Um, technology use and especially emerging technology use is um, um, it's not a coherent um, coordinated system so for the types of technologies we've been talking about there's the Food and Drug Administration to some extent you know I mentioned the FBI um, and then and then there are the funders the government funders of research who can who can regulate the research that they actually fund sponsor or conduct themselves they have limited jurisdiction in that sense um, and if you don't sort of fit under the jurisdiction of one of those bodies then what you're doing may not be regulated at all um, so a lot of people in conversation about food safety, technology safety, drug safety, or other issues coming up saying, why doesn't the FDA do something? And it's in part because the FDA is under-resourced from a lot of perspectives, but it's also because they have a fairly prescribed jurisdiction um, to regulate it all. It's defined by a federal statute for the most part, so it's up to Congress to change the scope of that. So just one example of that is that um, it's amazing, right, that um, cigarettes are allowed. They're clearly dangerous, <laughs> and they have no therapeutic effect. <laughs> um, and if they went up for review now, you know, they wouldn't pass. Um, but the FDA has had very little ability to regulate um, cigarettes. It wasn't really until the early 21st century that Congress gave the FDA, FDA authority um, to regulate tobacco products. Um, so in a sense, it's sort of hit and miss. And so when we talked about before, you know, if you had um, somebody using CRISPR for a dangerous purpose, then probably Congress or the states would step in and they would enact a law. And that's very often how we enact law, in response to one bad act. So we do it piecemeal. So when I was responding to regulatory, that's what I meant, was we tend to do it piecemeal um, in the United States, where in other countries, um, they take a more holistic view and they have sort of a governance structure or a set of sort of entities, governing structures that are set up to sort of um, take a big picture first. And they have a set of principles that they use. So for, in Canada, for example, they have deliberately and expressly incorporated a principle called the precautionary principle, um, which is completely unheard of in the United States. And the precautionary principle says that we should start by being a little bit skeptical <laughs> about this new or emerging technology use. Right? The, the burden is on the developer, in a sense, to prove that it's better, that it's going to be more valuable, and that it's not going to cause harm. Um, and we don't do that um, in the United States. With respect to assisted reproductive technologies in England, they have one central body, um, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, that has to approve which forms of in vitro fertilization are permissible to use there. And in certain cases, they approve uses on a one-by-one -one basis, um, so including pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for certain purposes. In other words, we don't do here, we don't do that in the United States. IVF went <coughs> straight to market um, here with um, the FDA didn't step in until later to regulate that kind of technology. So that's a little bit of what I meant. 
Professor well, I just had one final thought because I know we're almost out of time, but you make yeah. the point in your paper and, and others do as well that the FDA's authority is um, circumscribed, really a focus on efficacy and safety. Yeah. And there are deeper questions, like just one to raise is inequality. So, you know, another thing that's striking about all those images and so many just, the, if, you, if I say hacker, what do you think of? And like most of the time people think of this young white dude, yeah. uh, kind of your Silicon Valley type. Um, and I think we need to raise questions about the lack of diversity in Silicon Valley and the lack of diversity in these areas and the you know, associated types of economic and other inequality. So maybe it's safe and maybe it works, but do we, are we concerned if only a certain segment of the population gets it and on account of getting it, you know, it gets more and more and more, right? Um, I, I think those are questions that are kind of beyond FDA, but that maybe some yeah. other countries think about differently than we do. Yeah. And That's just true. a quick follow up on that. I, as I was listening to the language, and obviously this is a new topic for me to think about, but DIY bio is a, a relatively benign uh, description. Hacking, not so much, as you were kind yeah. of saying, right? And so I think the language, and both of you sort of touched on that in your talks, you know, understanding what this language means and what, what are we teaching ourselves as we speak about it, I think is important. Hacking is, is uh, um, you know, what, that really comes from sort of the computer science. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. back in the day, being able to hack into something you're not supposed to be hacking into, right? Implicitly. And so what does that mean? Right, and uh, so anyways, I, uh, I see that we do have one more question here. Um, hi, my name is Brendan Zhao, and I'm a student from a bioscience program in Shedek Maris High School. Um, I just want to say I may not be that professional, but I have three things to really consider it. So first, I see there are different between people who are using uh, biotechnology to complete bodily function since or if they are disabled or they lost part of their function. And there are also people who wants to enhance function by editing their bodies. And I think it's really, yeah, as uh, Dr. Yu say, it's really a, there should be a line draw between those two kind of people. And another thing I'm considering is that um, there isn't any legal thing that it against saying that we cannot turn against our body like doing anything to ourselves. But I think there should be something set up to um, do for those people who are doing surgery to help the others to enhance their bodily function. And so what I really want to say is, so back to the baseline, we are all animals. But for human, what really uh, define ourselves is our personality, our morality our cognition and as part of the psychology uh, things I want to say so I think the most important thing is to consider whether or not uh, the, the biohacking well whether or not the purpose of it is good or not whether or not it's for greater good or it's against human or if it is for greater good whether or not the way to reach for the purpose is right or not so that's what I want to know Thank you for your question. Thanks. And maybe it sounded almost like a statement. So. <laughs> it was a great set of comments. Statement. Okay. All right. Well, I see that we're we're essentially out of time. So I'm gonna maybe you can interact with the speakers when we are done because I think we have to wrap it up. But um, I would like everybody to please join me in thanking our excellent speakers. <laughs> <laughs>